The Inside the Rails podcast is supported by Great British Racing and In the Paddock. Inthepaddock.co.uk is a great place to start your shared ownership journey. Find racing clubs and syndicates with horses trained locally to you and at a cost that fits your budget using the search tools on the website. Within the paddock, your ownership journey could start sooner than you think. Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a monthly podcast for horse racing enthusiasts everywhere. And as ever, I'm joined by my co-host, Phil Boyle from BG Racing. Hi, Phil. How are you doing? Uh, hi, Simon. Yep, yeah, busy, busy at the moment. Since we last recorded, both of my horses have raced. Uh, I helped my trainer, Neil Mulholland, with his racing club and both of their horses have raced. Uh, I managed to spend 10 days in Northern Ireland on holiday, had a golf break weekend and still kept BG Racing up to date during that time. Oh, and on top of that, I managed to line up Josh Appiaffi from Sky Sports, the Racing Media Academy, Rewards for Racing and Racing Pathways to join us as an interview guest this month. So yeah, I'm thrilled he agreed to join us when he's got so much going on. Wow, you've certainly been a busy Mr B. And, and, and Phil, it's great getting Josh on as our guest. He's got many jobs, as you've just alluded to. There. He's, he must have more hats than I have in the back of my car. <laughs> At least you managed to get away, though. I've never been to Northern Ireland. Good time? Uh, yep, yeah, we had a great time. And my sister's working her way through visits to all the different National Trust properties in the UK. She writes a blog about each one after she's been. We managed to get her to 11 different ones in a 10-day holiday, but we did get to go racing as well, uh, Friday evening in Downpatrick, and actually that turned into a lovely story. I used to stand next to a gentleman named Jerry Hannity on the steps at Cheltenham Festivals, and we became friends from chatting at the races over the years. Listeners might know the surname, in fact, because Jerry's son, Niall, is a regular pundit on racing TV nowadays. Jerry always talked about getting me to the races at Downpatrick. He went to all the meetings there. And sadly, we never got that chance as Jerry unfortunately passed away just before Christmas last year. As much as anything, it was sort of in his memory that I arranged the Downpatrick visit. And so, yeah, it was a massive surprise and quite emotional to arrive and find that race three on the evening was a memorial race for Jerry organised by his family. And they were all there at the races. We we got to spend some time with them and, yeah, it really made the visit very special indeed. That, that really is a lovely story, Phil. I love it when unexpected events happen like that, don't you? It's lovely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you back any winners at Downpatrick? I think I backed the first two. Uh, I probably started thinking the game was easy and then I don't think I backed another one all night. But, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? That's the way it goes. Uh, now then, I know it's not just me that's been busy. Uh, tell me about your event in aid of riding for the disabled. Yes. So Gadsden Place Riding for the Disabled is a great charity that I'm involved with as a trustee. And we're 50 this year. So last Thursday was the first of three fundraising events I've been organising to help try and boost the charity coffers. And it was a 50th Golden May Ball at the very impressive Mansion House at Moor Park Golf Club. Now, I know you're a golfer. Have you played at Moor Park, Phil? Uh, no, never been there, no. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a golfer, but two lovely courses there. So um, if you ever get a chance, to do, go, do go and play at one of them. So in terms of the event itself, there were some 90 guests many from local businesses, and the evening started with a fizz reception. There was a fabulous three-course meal, followed by a live auction, and then dancing to a great singer and DJ, a guy I've worked with before called Isaac Oko. Really entertaining, got everybody on their feet. I was the MC for the evening and the auctioneer, so it was a change to be the man holding the gavel as opposed to doing the bidding, which is what I do at Tattersall's each October when I buy yearlings. Now, Early on in the evening, I did a heads and tails competition, but rather than toss a coin, which I think is a bit boring, I asked questions. So here's one of them for you, Phil. I know you like your music. What is the combined age of the current three members of the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood? Is it below or above 235. Now, we can't see each other now, but if, if you're playing the game, if you think it's higher than 235, put your hands on your head. And if it's less than 235, put your hands on your bottom. Uh, well, I, I, when I had a quick think through, I thought 225. So I'm going to go lower. Oh, I'm afraid you have to sit down. It's oh. 236. Oh, Mick Jagger's 80. No prize for me. 
Keith Richards <laughs> is 80, and the youngster Ronnie Wood is a mere 76. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That was the that was the opening question. I think that got half of the people sitting down actually, because like you, they didn't really get it. Um, anyway, it was a great evening. One of my cousins was the successful bidder on a fabulous cottage in St Ives, Cornwall. So a few of us and a family will be going there next autumn. We're still totting up the final figures, but the night raised a very healthy five figure sum. Sounds great, and uh, yeah, well done for the part you played in putting that together. Now, changing the subject slightly, let's review last month's racing. And I suspect you might want to talk to the listeners about a horse to follow that you provided in last month's podcast. Indeed, it turned into, um, well, Wiltshire, it was called, wasn't it? It ran and finished nowhere. Uh, moving on. Uh, <laughs> now, 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 trust you to mention the Willie Haggis runner who didn't win. I'd rather concentrate on the other one, Economics, who absolutely bolted up in the Dante Stakes at York, which is a trial for the Derby. He won by six lengths at a very tasty six to one, so I was happy. Um, beat the hot favourite, Ancient Wisdom. Funny enough, although the Dante is an important trial for the Derby, trainer William Haggis doesn't think the race will suit the horse. So he's currently not in it, and he'd have to be supplemented if he was to take part he might well go straight to Royal Ascot in the King Edward the Seventh, or he could go to the French Derby yeah I, I must admit I was being slightly mischievous there I know you tipped economics <laughs> he was a very good tip that you gave our listeners in fact actually today um, they have announced that he's not going to run in the Derby or the French Derby so it looks like Royal Ascot will be the plan and um, yeah I'll, I'll I'll give it to you you're you're a very shrewd judge sometimes <laughs> well that, that's hot news i must admit i didn't know about the derby news so uh so well done it's real hot off the press stuff it, it is although although it might be old news by the time our uh our listeners actually get to hear it yeah well since since we last recorded we've had the first two classics of the season at Newmarket, and we've also had the spring meetings at chester and york uh, obviously as you'll be aware what did you make of the action well, the first classic of the season, the 2000 Guineas, really threw up some stories. It was a high quality field. I mean, trainer Richard Hannon, who had the second and third in a race, um, he was talking about it being certainly the best for a good 10 years. The big question was, would the big talking horse, City of Troy, live up to the hype? The simple answer is no. The odds on favourite bombed out, finishing ninth of 11, beaten 17 lengths. The winner, though, notable speech, had won three out of three on the all-weather. Remarkable. This was his first ever race on grass. Uh, it was a great performance, certainly no fluke. The runner-up, Rosalian, uh, trained by Richard Hannon, who I did give a mention to, I think, in the last podcast. He ran a great race, and he's sure to win more races at the highest level. City of Troy, despite the flop, is still favourite for the derby at two to one. Well, you could hardly ever accuse me of being laconic, but even I'm a little speechless that he's still favourite. But, you know, perhaps it's just not a great derby. I was at Newmarket the following day for the Thousand Guineas, and that looked a wide open affair beforehand, and it proved to be the case. The winner was a 28 to 1 shot in Malka for trainer Roger Varian, and nice to see jockey Sylvester D'Souza in the big time again. Porta Fortuna at 11 to 1 was second, and the French raider Ramatuel was third. One who did catch the eye was a 50 to 1 shot, Relika, owned by my old boss Peter Harris and ridden by Holly Doyle. Uh, she was sixth, beaten just three and a half lengths. Look out for her at Royal Ascot, probably in the coronation stakes. As for the York Dante meeting, we've already talked about economics. Blue Stocking was another impressive six length winner, this time of the Group 2 Middleton Philly stakes, while the Musadora went to Andrew Balding's 22 to 1 winner, Secret Satire. And that again is a trial for the, for the Oaks. At Chester, the Aidan O'Brien camp resumed winning ways with two winners on the middle day, both ridden by Ryan Moore, who rode a treble. Marvellous, great stuff. And of course, our listeners will be enjoying the Derby and the Oaks shortly after this episode is released. As I've said, economics is not going to be added to the race, but uh, have you got anything else that you sort of seen in the Derby that takes your eye at the moment? Well, I said earlier on, didn't I? It may not be a great derby this year. Two or three horses, sadly, are not making the lineup. I'm not sure it's going to be a vintage one at this stage. Look, it wouldn't surprise me if City of Troy did an August rowdown by flopping the 2,000 guineas and then winning the derby. As for the Oaks, the market is headed by Aidan O'Brien's Lang Lang, who was fifth in the 1,000 guineas, beaten just a length, and that's normally a good trial um, for the Oaks. Uh, but that race looks pretty open at this stage. I, I'm, I'm really not sure at the moment. What about you, Phil? Uh, I'm sure I'll have a few bets, but um, 
you know, I think I've said before, I don't really bet much anti-post nowadays, so I'll probably just be looking at the racing the day before as usual. So, yeah, nothing to add to uh, your thoughts at the moment. Now then, we don't have any Solario racing or BG racing horses for the Derby meeting or indeed Royal Alaska in June, but... Um, sadly, sadly. Absolutely. We have got some runners elsewhere, I'm sure. Um, how are the Solario horses doing? When will we see them run next? Uh, well, it's been a quiet month. No runners during the last uh, three or four weeks, but we have two this weekend, both up north. Uh, Bohartha runs again at Pontefract. He made his debut there a month ago over five furlongs. This time he's going over six furlongs in a novice event for two-year-olds on the Friday. And sharp distinction, all being well, will go to Chester over two miles on the Saturday. I say all being well because they've had a heck of a lot of rain up there and there's an inspection tomorrow at two o'clock. I think both should run well if they both take part. Uh, Sharp Distinction has been in good form at home. He has had one run under his belt this season. Of course, by the time the podcast goes live, they will have already run. Um, BG Racing Horses, Phil, what, what's been going on there? Well, after a couple of quiet months, um, it all really kicked off for me since we last recorded. Listeners might remember I was looking forward to Bella Cavalla running just after we recorded last month and... Um, yeah, if you check those results, you'll realise that it went just about as badly as it could have done. She raced, and I have to use that term very loosely, at Ludlow. She looked in trouble by the time they jumped the first hurdle, and she dropped behind the field before pulling up before halfway. It was pretty devastating for us all, because we we really did expect so much more than that. Whilst you never like to see one of your horses injured, uh, we did find a big swelling on one of her hind legs the following day, and that did at least provide us with a possible reason for her poor run. So, yeah, after some treatment, we got her back to the races this month at Utoxeter. Um, I must admit, after the after the poor run at Ludlow, our expectations were very low. Uh, she went off a 66-1 to 1 outsider. So uh, it was a massive surprise and, and a massively good surprise to see her travelling well through the race and staying on at the end to finish third. She was only beaten by the two market leaders and... Yep, she looks right back on track, hopefully ready to win a race or two this summer. So really good news. Good stuff, good stuff. Did you avail yourself of the 66 to 1 each way? Uh, I didn't. I uh, I told everyone not to back her. And obviously, as you know, in these situations, <laughs> several of them contacted me afterwards to tell me how much money they'd won. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say, jockeys are bad tipsters, trainers are even worse, and racing managers are the worst of the lot. So uh, there you go. Anyway, what about Strider? What's he up to? Uh, yeah, he got over his various niggles. Uh, we managed to get him back on the race course on a Monday evening at Windsor. Um, unfortunately, he stumbled a bit out of the stalls, which cost him a couple of lengths, uh, but then he travelled okay. Uh, he just didn't really finish off his race. And our jockey, Rab Havlin, reported that he'd had a big blow over a furlong from home and he clearly wasn't quite race fit after a few weeks off. So, yeah, Rab thought the race would put him spot on for next time. Um, I hope he's right. And if so, yeah, he should go very close when he runs at Brighton on the 3rd of June. Um, I'm not sure what price he'll be, but I'm hoping that if any of our listeners decide to risk a couple of quid on him there, he might he might provide a bit of a reward. Well, as listeners probably know, regular listeners, we uh, we go on air on the 1st of the month. So if you listen to our podcast on the 1st of June, you've got a couple of days to get your money down for a strider. Good luck with him. Now, moving from flat to jumps, I know you were at Huntingdon recently, not with a runner, but for the latest syndicate showcase. How did that go? Uh, yeah, it was a nice evening, thanks. Um, chatted to several race goers while we were there. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's very enjoyable. The next one of those is on uh, Monday, the 10th of June at Carlisle. Um, obviously, I, I don't think I'm going to make my way all the way up to Carlisle <laughs> for that one. But uh, yeah, if any of our listeners live near Carlisle and are interested in getting involved in shared ownership, I'd, I'd definitely try and go to one of these meetings or particularly that one at Carlisle. Chat to one or more of the syndicate managers that will be there. They can give you all the information about why shared ownership is so brilliant. Absolutely. Here, here to that. Now, another event you're going to is the RSA, the Racehorse Syndicates Association, day at Weatherby's on 30th of May. Weatherby's are the organisation that actually uh, run the administration of racing, entries and declarations and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I am. I'm taking several of my shareholders there. I think there's about 90 people visiting that day okay. and we're all going on to Warwick races in the evening. Um, it's free to 
syndicate members for from all the different race or syndicates association syndicates so yeah it'd be great to see behind the scenes at the racing administration team and and also see some racing action as well um yeah just another perk of joining a syndicate that is in the rsa uh access to events like these are just another part of being involved in shared ownership and i think you know really bring something extra to the experience yes there really is so much more to shared ownership than just seeing your horse run now, it's that time of the day when I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Josh Apiafi. Hi, Josh. Welcome to Inside the Rails. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Thank you. The, uh, the rain has passed and, yes, the clear skies of late May are finally here. Well, welcome to Inside the Rails. Thank you very much for joining us. I think you're talking to us from the Midlands, aren't you, at the moment? I am. I'm in actually what I would call my hometown. From the ages of four to 16, I lived in the south of Nottingham or Nottinghamshire, I'm currently sat here after covering Subble last night and sat at a friend's place near Papplewick, which is a very nice part of the North Knots. Great. Now, many will know you as a presenter on Sky Sports Racing, although you have many other hats in the industry. Can you tell us a little bit about your presenting role, when you started, how often you're on, and what indeed is your role? Quite randomly, I'd been at the Asian Racing Conference in Seoul in Korea, and I knew the guys that ran Sky, and they said, should we go out for lunch? And I said, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I love trying new local food. So we went to a local restaurant just around the corner from this big conference centre, and then thought we'd have a few beers and put the world to rights. And they turned around and said, Sky Sports Racing is about to launch, and would you consider becoming a presenter? And wow. I was slightly taken aback and said I'd go away and think about it, talk to my wife, about Abby, about it. I then went back to them and said, if you invest in me, I'll invest in you. And fair play, they did. I got given the lead producer in Dermot Comiskey, uh, who'd come from, all the way back from sort of Sunset and Vine and, and places like that. And he watched every minute that I was on television for the first six months and had one of those amazing ways of telling you that you may have been rubbish, but you still felt good afterwards. So... There you go. I do five days a month for Sky, unless it's uh, Racing League or Royal Alaska. And then I do documentaries, which I hope has in some way moved the dial somewhat on a diversity and inclusion front, which I know we're going we're gonna to speak about later on. We've got, we've got a very good relationship because I don't do it as a full time job and I'm pretty relaxed uh, about where I go and what I do. Um, I think I can fit in uh, quite easily uh, compared to some people, obviously, that want to be on TV as much as possible because it's their number one source of, in of income. OK, well, that's great. That's given our listeners a nice insight into the presenting role. But I did mention that you have many hats. How did you actually get into racing? What's the Josh Apiafi story? <laughs> I asked you about how much time we had and I'm about to <laughs> enter my 50th year. We're going we're gonna to fly through the early years. I rode horses from the age of, age of four. Um, but for me, they, they, they were my adrenaline rush I wanted to go as fast as possible and, as, and over as big offences as possible um, rather than an actual love of horses which I now have and developed sort of I suppose into my late teens and then onwards from there but no all I wanted to do was go pretty quick and at six foot at 15 it's a bit random that you want to be a, a, a jockey um, and I've played basketball for the England under 16s and had a jockey's license at the same time wow wow <laughs> Yeah, so my strap line is too fat to be a jockey and too to and too short to be a basketball player, um, and but did both uh, and enjoyed both. Rode as an amateur for a, um, so, so three or four years, well, five years in total, but three or four years where I was riding out every day and all that kind of stuff, and then I went back to college uh, at 18. Fascinating, Josh. Thank you for that. Um, now, one of your many other jobs is with Rewards for Racing, which you founded, and I believe you now chair the organisation. Can you explain to our listeners a little about the scheme? Sure. Rewards for Racing is a rewards programme similar to an air miles programme where you shop and you bet and a percentage of your turnover comes back in points. So if you got a hotel room with hotels.com. Um, I think they're currently paying 5% in rewards for racing points. You would get five pounds in rewards for racing points that you could put against your next ticket to the races. Or if you placed a bet with Bet365, 1% of your bet stake comes back in points. And you can use that again against any transaction with our 41 race courses that we've got on the programme. 
I'm delighted to say we've got 1.3 million members on the program and we were responsible for 20% of all attendances to UK racing in the last 12 months. That's incredible. Great achievement. Well done on that. Um, I'm actually a member, so there you go. Um, Racing Pathway is another venture that you launched. Again, can you tell us a little bit about that and what it's achieved to date? Sure. The Racing Pathway was something that about five or six years ago, um, much to the delight of my wife, my midlife crisis, rather than buying a Ferrari and having an affair, I decided that I needed to... uh, somewhat changed the sport and when I say somewhat changed the sport I was very aware that the the channels of I suppose uh, revenue um, of uh, race goer attendance of betting turnover were all on a precipice of a cliff I think we're we're we're, we're halfway down the cliff and I hope we can uh, we can rescue it back but equally it was to go, okay, how can we make our sport far more accessible to a larger gene pool than we currently attract um, where the diversity and inclusion uh, element came into it? And what do those pathways look like into our sport, whether you want to be a fan or whether you want to be in the workforce in any way, shape or form? I think our pathway into being stable staff is very good. We've got some fantastic facilities in the uh, British Racing School and the National Racing College and um, the Scottish Racing Academy. But equally, if you wanted to work in the sport outside of the stable yard, then there, are, there isn't a definitive pathway. And most people you meet that work in the commercial or the administrative side of the sport, they're on their second or third jobs before they find racing. And I want people going through schools and universities going, I really want to work in horse racing, or I really want to run Ascot Racecourse, or I really want to run Cheltenham Racecourse and be part of the amazing sport that we've got, and there wasn't anything out there. So we put a strategy together, um, called it the Racing Pathway. We've got all the stakeholders in the sport were, were fully backing of it because there wasn't there wasn't a strategy within the sport. I still think there isn't a, an industry strategy within the sport, which I've called out a couple of times. And I think there's some individual ones from individual organisations, but there definitely isn't a, a, an overall industry strategy. So I decided that this is what we would do. We'd look where the spaces were and the gaps were within that. We developed the racing business apprenticeship because entry-level jobs were few and far between outside of the stable yard. So I'm delighted to say that we've got 10 apprentices out there. There's five working at ARC. And again, it's making sure that those entry levels and that pathway through to fulfilling yourself within the sport is exactly that. The pathway is to make sure that no matter who you are, where you're from, there is a place for you to land within British horse racing to further your engagement. Brilliant. And I, and I think it's a nice little segue into something that I was quite interested in, Josh, which is the Racing Media Academy. I see all the social media for that. Um, when you've got the youngsters coming in every year, sort of trying to get involved in the racing media. So um, can you tell us a bit about that? What's your role in there and, and how's it doing? Yeah, so I founded that as part of the racing pathway. And it's interesting that that's probably, it's the most highlighted element. The Racing Media Academy was one because I, uh, selfishly, I wanted a, a far more diverse face of our sport in years to come so people can recognise themselves within the sport. Because if you don't recognise yourself consuming a product in some way, shape or form, you're not going to sell it or you're not going to engage with it. So I wanted to make sure that both in front and behind the camera and all the different types of media, especially social media that we've got now, that there are far more different faces, different accents that were coming across and that the barriers to entry weren't just, again, that same gene pool. If you lower those barriers, it's amazing who walks through the door. And that's why it's been such a success. The cadets that we've had through various different ages there's the it's a minimum of 18 to apply there is no maximum age group i think our uh, eldest applicant this year was 65 and it is again that the partners that we've got involved we had 10 media partners in year one we've got 13 now um i'm comfortable with 13 around that mark because there aren't hundreds of jobs because it is fantastic once you get in there there isn't a great turnover of people both in front or behind camera so 
Um, but again, it's getting people from different backgrounds. And then, of course, diverse thinking starts, that we're not all thinking the same thing. And that's the great thing. You'll be more, far more attractive to a broader set of people if that thinking is far more diverse behind the strategy. Brilliant, brilliant. We've had Rishi Prasad on the podcast in the past, and I know he's worked with you, uh, and he spoke very similarly about getting people to see more more faces and accents, as you say, that to make racing more accessible. But in terms of diversity, you know, where are we at? What what do we still need to improve? I think there's a lot of work to be done. We need to have a strategy first. <laughs> um, yes, we've got the racing. I, you know, mine was born out of frustration uh, in terms of the racing pathway. Um, and also I'd read the All Blacks book, Legacy, uh, which is a great book for anyone to read, um, which is where they look at the strategies that the All Blacks use, but put it into a business sense. And one of the um, takeouts that I got from there was leave the hut better than you found it. And not many people know that the All Black team and the team only clean their changing room so it's spick and span after a game, no one else, just them, to leave at their huts cleaner than when they found it. And I was conscious that I felt that British horse racing was in a far better place when I entered it in 1991 than it was today. And I needed to do something about that. And that wasn't a legacy play. For me, that was that just how I, you know, how I felt. But I was in a position that I could initiate change through basically the contacts and the time that I've had in the sport. On a diversity and inclusion front, that was, you know, a big play. And it took me about a year to try and work out where my place was and what I could possibly do there. Sky were huge backers, Rob Dakin um, being at the forefront of that in terms of Sky backing me when we were bringing about more about the diversity in terms of the Leading the Way series that we initially kicked off not long after uh, the George Floyd murder. Um, and... Following that, I was trying to get the sport to move and look at bringing about DNI. Black Lives Matter had come about, and it was, I realized pretty, well, not pretty quickly, I suppose it took me about 18 months to realize, and you'll see the frustration that Rishi and I both had that every other sport was showing solidarity to the ethnic minority side of racing's family, I suppose. Um, whereas racing put that and they made that conscious decision and i finally got them to admit it and admit it publicly that they put their head in the sand uh when it came to black lives matter and dni because they felt they were so poor at it they should they shouldn't do anything when actually if you asked um the ethnic minority side of, uh, of racing's family what you'd want to do that would have been lovely to have been asked so but what i then realized over that sort of 18 month period is you can't force someone or an industry into a corner if they don't actually know the answer and i think this is where the racing pathway came about i was like okay because if you force a rat into a corner it'll either come out fighting a lion or it'll just curl up into a ball our sport decided it was going to curl up into a ball and hope this went away so that's where i went okay well i'm going to go and do something and fair play, they've been huge, you know, from the BHA to the RCA to, you know, all stakeholders have been fantastic supporters. Uh, and it's gone through that period of supporting, saying, well done, keep going, to now actually saying, what can we actually do? And the advent of the People Board, I believe their strategy is due for release later this summer. And I sincerely hope that DNI is at at the core of that, because what is DNI? DNI is about making sure that we're going out to as many people as possible, lowering the barriers to entry, uh, both, like I say, fan base and workforce. Brilliant. And yeah, congratulations on your part of pushing that forward. Last question from me. We obviously set this podcast up, Simon and I, because we're passionate about shared ownership syndicates in particular and just wondered if you had views on shared ownership and its importance to the sport and indeed whether you've been involved or not. Um, I think it's it should be damn near the top, I think, in terms of how we expand the ownership base. Again, bringing down the barriers. But if any of you guys can tell me what the strategy is to grow syndicates and partnerships in British horse racing, I would love to hear it. And it should be someone's job and it currently isn't. 
that's what other jurisdictions that have done well have, you know, be it Ireland, you know, with Irish thoroughbred marketing, be it down in Australia, the huge organizations and huge money put behind it. Um, it's definitely the way forward because it's also your pathway to ownership. The majority of our bigger sole owners outside of royalty or international royalty started by having a share in a halt with their mates. Um, and that's, and that's where it starts. And then they've got enough wealth that they then go on to, uh, own horses individually. So it's a great starting place, let alone be a great place. I far prefer, uh, I've owned horses in, uh, singularly and I've owned horses in partnerships and I've owned horses in syndicates. And I far prefer, uh, partnerships and syndicates because it's damn difficult to high five, your, high five yourself. Um, you know, and it said, and the banter on the WhatsApp group and got all that kind of stuff. You know, if a statistically a horse is running on the, uh, over jumps four times a year and whatever it is, 6.8 times a year on the flat, then if you're paying 24 grand a year in training fees and all the associated costs, that's an expensive uh, pastime if you're only getting six, uh, four to six highlights a year. But you've got to include more highlights. WhatsApp groups are brilliant in terms of lots of highs and banter, so that keeps it going throughout. Mornings on the gallops, breakfast with jockeys and breakfast with the trainers – those sort of highlights we need to do a heck of a lot more with. And I truly hope that the sport invests in putting a team together about expanding uh, syndicates and partnerships within our sport uh, to a far broader, like I say, a far broader audience. Uh, in terms of me, yeah, the old Betfarians, we haven't got a horse in training at the moment, although I've got, a, I've got an ex-race horse um, that Andrew Black and I, uh, founder of Betfair, owned together we owned a, a few captain peacock won a few hurdle races for us uh and won six on the flat uh his brother spice war won a couple of uh, all weather hurdle uh, all weather races should i say uh didn't like hurdling and is now currently in uh pony club with my daughter wishing he'd run a little bit quicker around kempton park um, and i suppose the highlight uh of it all was we got big occasion from Colbor and aiden o'brien um, he, he was by Sadler's Wells, certainly wasn't bred to be a national winner. And he ended up winning the Midlands Grand National, which was um, a real highlight for my wife and I. Uh, I met my wife at Utoxeter. I rode my last winner at Utoxeter. And our ownership um, highlight was also at Utoxeter. So it's a, a fond place in our heart. Well, Josh, Phil and I have really enjoyed talking to you. So many great stories. But there is one final question from me. And it's one we like to ask all of our guests. If you could change three things in British racing for the good of British racing, what would they be? Right, I hope you've got some time. <laughs> <laughs> so my first one would I would it's called centralized ticketing. There needs to be a one-stop shop where you can go on and within three clicks you can buy a ticket to any race course in the country. Currently, if you type in go racing to Google, which you guys can and anyone that listening can you'll see what comes up is go racing in Yorkshire, which is fine if you live in Yorkshire, go racing in Ireland, which is fine if you live in Ireland. And then it generally comes up with uh, your local go-kart track um, if you want tickets to Formula One. Um, and we need our train line, basically, that you can go on there, type in your postcode. It will come up and say that, you know, your radius of how far you're prepared to travel, that our Fixtures are segmented, music nights, student nights, premier nights, you know, and you can type in whichever one you want and it spits it out, gives you the QR code and away you go. So three clicks and you go. So centralised ticketing. At the moment when Great British Racing do a promotion, they have to send you to a site where you can link off to 59 different race courses. Well, a lot of people don't even know where their local race course is. So yeah. having a fully functional equivalent of the train line would be my first one. My second one would be a fan site. And you're going to go, but we've already got the Racing Post, Josh, and we've already got at theraces.com, and we've already got this. They're all for over 18. Imagine if you are a 15-year-old, you've seen horse racing going on on the TV, or you're lucky enough to go to a meeting, and you want to become a fan of horse racing. Every single one of our digital platforms are for over 18s. So where are the stories about Tom and Holly? You know, where are the stories about... Hewick, where you know all these lovely amazing stories that people can fall in love with we don't care about you till you're 18 because that's when you can buy a ticket or you can place a bet 
And that's where people's bonus structure and their revenue comes from. And what I want people to fall in love, fandom is done by the age of 15. You're, not, you're going to be a fan by the age of 15. After that, you can engage in stuff, but generally you become a fan by the age of 15. And we've got nothing out there other than racing to school, which is a one-hit wonder, isn't it? An amazing day. Where's the pathway from going on a racing to school day? A digital pathway, because, of course, everyone of Gen Z and Gen Alpha and Gen Beta live through a mobile device. And our platforms on a mobile device, there are not one for the under 18s. So that's my second call is a fan site, which isn't just for under 18s. We should just have a fan site like F1.com, you know, for our sport. So a digital platform on that front, which is non-betting related. And the final one, I'll drop you a grenade. I don't think we should race on a Monday. I think the fixture list needs cutting back. And I think you should give everyone a day off in the week because one of my favorite lines I've ever heard throughout my 30 whatever years, 40 years in the sport was from John Frankham, who said, what's the fun in biscuits if there's always biscuits in the tin? (laughs) <laughs> and that's it. There's just far too much racing. It's no surprise that Sunday night racing was not a success, be it on a financial front or on a resort, a human resource front. And I think by taking Monday off, it gives people a bit of a refresh. Well, that's great, Josh. And I think you get the prize for being our first guest, I think, who hasn't mentioned prize money. So brilliant. <laughs> Three really good suggestions. Um, I like the idea of a day off. I'm not sure Windsor Racecourse might go along with Mondays, but I take your, your point. There is definitely far too much racing. And I know Phil would agree with that as well. We've really enjoyed having you on. It just leaves me to wish you the very best of luck this year with all of your different projects and particularly diversity. So thank you so much, Josh, for coming on. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated and uh, good luck with the future episodes. Wow. Does that man ever come up for air? I don't mean in terms of how he talks, but in terms of the number of jobs he does. Absolutely unbelievable. I thought I was a busy person. I also like the idea of having a day off from racing, don't you, Phil? Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, just amazed by some of the... Uh some of the ideas that that Josh has clearly got. Um, His head must be a very busy place. He's uh, clearly given a lot of thought to the ways in which the industry could improve. And, yeah, I knew he'd be a good guest and, uh, yeah, thoroughly uh, inspired and enthused by listening to him. That uh, That was brilliant. Now, of course, I need to finish off the podcast by encouraging our listeners to get involved in shared ownership, as we always do. Simon and I are always delighted to chat to you if, our horses are of interest to you or if we can provide you with any advice but um, there's loads of options out there for getting involved in shared ownership it really is a brilliant experience the in the paddock website which great british racing provide is a good resource to find a syndicate or racing club you know they've got the right price and the right location to meet whatever you are happy to spend and wherever you live And if you could also support Inside the Rails by following us to get new episodes when they're released, and please tell people about us. Well, that just leaves me to thank our sponsors, Great British Racing, co-host Phil Boyle from BG Racing, our very special guest, Josh Apiaffi, producer Callum Ronan from Callum Ronan Creative, and of course, you, the listeners. City of Troy disappointed in the 2000 guineas, but will he emulate stablemate August Rodin? and bounce back to win the derby? Or are his feet made of clay? This is Simon Double from Solario Racing saying, thank you for listening to Inside the Rails, and until next time, goodbye. The Inside the Rails podcast is supported by Great British Racing and In the Paddock. Inthepaddock.co.uk is a great place to start your shared ownership journey. Find racing clubs and syndicates with horses trained locally to you, and at a cost that fits your budget, using the search tools on the website. Within the paddock, your ownership journey could start sooner than you think.